What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Pick 6 Podcast. I am John Breach, and I am here with Leger Doosable for another episode of Doosdays with Breach, which is backed by popular demand. We were so good last week, Leger. They wanted us to do this every single day, and I was like, no, it's it's Tuesdays. It's not Wednesdays <laughs> or Thursdays. It's only Tuesdays. So, yeah. You- I'm good, Breach. It was so funny because last week we were making light of how we haven't actually worked together on the Pick 6 pod. And the first time we met each other was actually in Vegas for Super Bowl. And now look at us. Two weeks in a row. Who would have thought it? Unbelievable. And uh, today's (laughs) live from the Jets facility. Uh, So everything we talk about in the draft day, you know that it's going to be top notch when we talk about the Jets. Uh, And you know what we're doing, Leger? We are talking about the NFL draft today. It is just over two weeks today. We're going to play some matchmaker. Uh, You probably watch a lot of blind date as a kid like me, so you're probably good (laughs) at the matchmaking thing. Uh, It it is what it sounds like it is. We are going to take some of the top prospects in the draft, and we are going to match them with the team that best fits. And because Dews spent his entire career playing on the defensive side of the ball, we are going to do defensive matchmaker. Uh, And you know what? We are going to start with the only position, I think, on the defensive side of the ball that might have a top 10 pick, and that is your pass rushers, your edge guys. Uh, It really would be a shocker if we see any other position go in the top 10. Uh, And so let's stop. We're kind of looking at our CBS Sports uh, prospect, kind of going down that list, our prospect rankings. And so we're going to start at the top there with Dallas Turner, the Alabama star. Dudes, what do you think of him, and where do you think the best fit is? Yeah, highest upside in regards to the edge rushers breach. When you look at him, nobody has a better long arm as far as speed, the power to get to the quarterback. Um, does a really good job just destroying tight ends against the run. There'll be times you turn the film on, Brees, and the defense doesn't line up, and you know the offense will try to get the defense off kilter by snapping the ball while the defense is moving around, and you see him just decimate a tight end and make a play in the backfield. Uh, we saw the athletic ability at the combine. I want to say he ran somewhere in the four fives. We see the ability to drop in coverage. To me, has the highest upside as well. Do you want to give – your team or should I give my team where I think he should go? Uh, You go, you go first. Uh, I think, and and you stated this perfectly, Brees, when you look at all the defensive players, there's probably only going to be one, maybe two go in the top 10. I think at pick number eight, the Atlanta Falcons make the most sense for Dallas uh, Turner. When you look at what Arnold Ebicady did last year and him having a, you know, a second year growth in his development, playing really well. And then, Grady Jarrett and David Anyumata inside. Raheem Morris, defensive-minded coach, needs a guy like Dallas Turner to really build this defense around. Like, this was a defense that was a top-10 defense for most of the season. Now, towards the back end of the season, kind of sloughed off, and I think they end up finishing somewhere in the teens. But you talk about Jesse Bates at at the, you know, the safety position. Talk about Terrell, A.J. Terrell at the cornerback position. You need you another edge guy to really solidify this defense. I think Dallas Turner to the Falcons – Makes too much sense. Yeah, and we saw the Falcons kept making uh, acquiring offensive players, whether it was Kirk Cousins, Rondale Moore, Darnell right. Mooney. And it was like, oh, they have this defensive genius as their head coach. When's he going to go after his edge guy? <laughs> and yeah. it does feel like he was kind of waiting for the draft. Uh, I am going to do my best. I am not going to send any guy to where Dues is sending them. So I'm going to just throw a team out there that Dues didn't say. Uh, okay. And I am going to go with the Bears here. I think mm. uh, you look at this. This is a team that needs pass rushing help. Uh, my only hesitation there is you look at that ninth overall pick. I could absolutely see them taking a wide receiver. Uh, but if there's a receiver, that's, a, that's there, an interesting conversation. Why, why do you think they should take a, a receiver at nine? Well, I think you look at Keenan Allen is only con- under contract through 2024. So he's likely gone after this season. And then you have a one punch. You don't have a one, two punch. You just, you have one guy. And if you're drafting Caleb Williams, number one overall, which I assume we agree on that, right? Great. Uh, <laughs> you know, you want to make sure you have some weapons for him because you can't put him in a spot where he's going to struggle or where he gets frustrated, uh, where he hates his coaching staff or where he's <laughs> complaining that he doesn't have weapons. So I, I just think it's a delicate balance when you take that quarterback, number one overall, that you almost feel compelled to add another weapon. And that, that's, I think it's 50-50. I, I, that's why I'm putting uh, Dallas Turner 
in Chicago because I absolutely think that pass rushing is more important, but I could see them taking a receiver. <clears throat> and I'm glad you finished the statement by saying that because when you look <laughs> at what they did for Montez Sweat and training for him, I know a lot of people, you know, kind of scruffed and gruffed at that trade, giving up a second round pick. And I stated it firmly on, you know, spotlight. I said, when you trade a guy for a second round pick, you're going to be doing future business with him. And boy, did they do future business with Montez Sweat, signing him into the extension. But it's what he did, the mindset that he brought over with that Chicago Bears defense, right? This was a defense that was really good against the run. They were number one against the run last year in run defense. And this was a team, when he got there, it kind of transcended on defense, right? Last six weeks of the season, Breeze, they were the top scoring defense. They were one in interceptions, and they were one in regards to giving up rushing touchdowns. Right. This this is why I think it makes a lot of sense, you know, for the Bears to go edge as well instead of receiver, because when you look at the offense, I don't think a number one or former number one pick could say that they were in a better situation than Caleb Williams is going into than the Chicago Bears. Right. You got D.J. Moore as a true number one. You talked about Keenan Allen being only the only one year deal. But let's not forget, they got Cole Komet, who is a really good tight end, and they signed him to an extension and they signed Gerald Everett. So I can see them going more 12 personnel as well, right? And then you talk about the offensive line. People are saying, why don't they take offensive tackle? I like Braxton Jones. I think he's a really good young offensive tackle. And they took Darnell Wright last year in the first round as well. So when you look on paper, like this is the best scenario a former or future number one pick will be going into because not only have they really put things in place for him to succeed on offense, we didn't even talk about the three backs that they have. But on defense, he, this team can be led by his defense where he doesn't feel like he needs to be Superman because of how they finish the season. And if they were to add a edge guy at nine, I think it makes a lot of sense just because Matt Eberflus, defensive-minded coach, you can take this defense to the next level. Well, and you know what's funny is I'm kind of smiling here if you're watching on YouTube because uh, our next guy is Jared Verse, a pass rusher. And as you can clearly see by dudes talking for the past 60 <laughs> seconds, uh, he clearly believes the Bears need to take a pass rusher at number nine overall. Uh, so, dudes, I think we can all predict where you have Jared Verse going. Yeah, I have him going number nine right after Dallas Turner going eight to the Falcons. I got Jared Verse going nine to the Chicago Bears. And it's for everything I just stated, right? Montez Sweat transform, helped transform this defense, right? This is an elite defense. And now you can add a book in on the other side who's going to fit in personal personality-wise perfect with the Chicago Bears and what they want to be. They want to be a tough-nosed, gritty defense. That's exactly what Jared Verse is. Brees, his whole game starts with power. Like, there's, there's games you turn on the film where he doesn't actually sack the quarterback, but he puts the tackle on top of the quarterback, and that's how the quarterback gets sacked. Like, his speed, the power is is – is night and day better than everybody's in this draft. But the thing that I really love about him, Brees, is that he could have came out last year and been probably a middle-of-the-round first-round pick, but he came back and honed his game. Like, last year was all speed to power, straight bull rush. Now he has some counters off of it. So you can tell the game means something to him. And then when you turn on a film, you constantly see him running guys down from behind 20, 30 yards. He plays with extreme effort. And that's another thing that this Chicago Bears defense really does. So – to me, the number nine pick should be Jared Verse for the Chicago Bears. And, and let me ask you this, because it does feel like Turner and Verse are kind of the consensus top two pass rushers in the draft. Yeah. Do you have them in that order, Turner at one and Verse at two, or do you think they're kind of interchangeable? I think that's how I have it in that order. I know me and Ryan Wilson have talked about this. He kind of has Verse a little bit higher than Turner. I think the ceiling's a lot higher for Dallas Turner. I think we kind of know what Jared Verse is going to be, and that's not saying anything bad. It's kind of like Aiden Hutchinson and, and Trayvon Walker conversation. Like, I think the Jaguars, if they could go back, they would take Aiden Hutchinson one of all, even though he's a guy that's probably going to get eight to ten sacks every year and maybe not eclipse 15 or 16. But with Dallas Turner, I think the upside is what gives him the edge over Jared Verse. All right, we've talked about – Jared Verse from Florida State, Dallas Turner from Alabama. Let's move out to the West Coast and get a little Leatu Latu from UCLA. Uh, probably not going to be a top 15 pick, but it would be surprising if he fell out the first round. I think he will end up being taken the first round. Dudes, it looks like you have him going in the first round. Where do you have him going? Yeah, and honestly, Brees, if it wasn't for the medical, if it wasn't even a question to mark about the neck, he'd probably be my edge one. Because nobody rushes with a game plan better than Laatu Latu. 
it's almost like he's a veteran when it comes to pass rushing and getting after the quarterback. He kind of reminds me of a jiu-jitsu warrior in, in, in regards to how many moves he throws to get to the quarterback, counters after counters after counters. And again, if it's not for the medical, he's probably my edge number one because he's one of those guys, Reese, where I'm not saying you can't get better coaching, but he's a guy from day one you can put out there on third down and say, go get the quarterback. And there's not much you got to do. Like, just go get the quarterback. Go do what you do. He's that type of guy. He has that type of hand usage. And the thing is, with that, that long arm leave, he does a really good job of knocking tackles and tight ends back in the run game. So he's not a liability in the run as well. So I think the biggest thing for him, Brees, is the medical, right? How do teams feel about the neck, the, you know, the, the past neck injury? If they're comfortable with it, I don't think he's falling. He's not going to fall out the first round. But if teams are really comfortable with it, I think it should be a top 15 pick. And so you have them in Tampa Bay with Tampa the Bucks. Bay. They need some edge rush. They took Kalaji Kansi last year on the inside. Joe Tryon is a guy that they've really tried to see what kind of role they can find with him. Uh, Yaya Diaby was a rookie outside linebacker that played really well for them last year. I think you need a guy opposite of Diaby and let Joe Tryon be kind of like your swing guy, even though you took him late in the first round. I think a pairing of Yaya Diaby and Latu Latu make a lot of sense for Todd Bowles in that defense. Yeah, and we were talking a little bit last week about the Buccaneers and how much they need some pass rush help. And as you said, having someone like that kind of fall in their lap at 26, uh, you would think they would turn that card in within 30 seconds. Quickly. Uh, yeah, he's still <laughs> on the board. Uh, you know, I thought about sending him to Seattle. I think he'd be a good I thought about hit. that too. But yeah. but like you said, maybe that's a little bit too high because of the injury issues with Seahawks picking 16th overall. But I think, uh, you know, you mentioned all the tools he had in his toolbox, how athletic he is, and, and Mike McDonald's proven he's a very, very good defensive coach and he knows what to do. Uh, he knows how to put his guys in a position to succeed. Uh, yeah, so I think that Latu in Seattle would be interesting. All right, let's get to the guy with the best name out of all the edge rushers. <laughs> that is Chop Robinson out of Penn State. Dudes, what do you like about him, and where are you sending him? Now, I want to preface this by saying I think I might have done this right before the Stefan Diggs trade. So um, the thing about Chop Robinson, nope. Edge guy has a better first step get off in this draft than him. Uh, freakish athletic, freak athlete, uh, does a lot of things naturally in regards to bending and be able to bend that edge and get to the quarterback. Needs a lot of help in regards to hand usage. You know, we talked about La Atu Latu. It's a total opposite, right? La Atu Latu has great hands where Top Robinson doesn't use his hands that well and kind of out athletic people, out athletic guys. But he also has a good speed to power move, too. We see the lower body strength, right, in, in, in regards to speed to power. But he needs some help in his hand users to get off that speed to power to get to the quarterback. And this one, I had him going to the Bills, but I would not be surprised if the Bills now, because of the Stefan Diggs trade, potentially trade up to try to get a guy like Brian Thomas. But they need edge help as well because Von Miller is getting up there in age. Um, struggled last year coming back from the injury. They did resign. I think uh, Epineza, uh, but still, I think they need one more edge guy, and I think he fits the mold of what they're trying to do in regards to coming off the edge and getting to the quarterback with the Bills. Yeah, and even after the dig trade, I don't think this is completely crazy to have him going there because, A, there's no guarantee the Bills are going to be able to move up and try and get a guy that they're kind of eyeballing. And Correct. then if they sit there, you sit down at the bottom of the first round, you have the 28th overall pick. There's no guarantee – the receiver you want is going to fall on your lap. If you're down Correct. to the sixth best guy on your board, are you going to take him or are you going to take your edge three uh, who would be Chop Robinson behind, say, Burst and Turner? So I think that he could absolutely still end up in Buffalo. All right, we are done talking about the edge guys. When we come back, we are going to matchmaker, place a matchmaker with the cornerbacks in the draft. Every spring, we marvel at its majesty. A tradition unlike any other, The Masters. This weekend on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Man, quarterback, that, we're starting off with the two biggest positions. Clearly, Harry, Harry, our producer, smartly set this up. One from the pass rushers to the corners. Seems like the biggest difference makers on defense. Um, let's see if we can be very, very good with our matchmaking. I want to see where you have... This is my guy because he's from a Mac school. 
University of Toledo. Toledo. I went to Miami of Ohio. So anytime I see a possibility of a Matt guy going the first round, I get unreasonably excited. I will probably have a Quinion Marshall or Mitchell draft party at my house where I just wave a Toledo flag when he gets drafted. Uh, So what do you like about him and where do you have him going? I mean, I love Q's game. I, I got to see him and spend some time with him at the Senior Bowl this past year. And the thing I love about him, Brees, is that it seems like he's just never in a panic, right? He's never in a panic. He always matches the receiver step for step. He's always in phase perfectly. And then the ability to go up and attack the football and take it away from you. I mean, there was a play versus Brandon, uh, Braden Rice in, this, in the Senior Bowl where he hit him on a post. And he got him a little bit, but... Quinn and Mitchell, you saw the, the catch-up speed. And then not only that, he jumped over top of Brandon Rice. For, for people that don't understand, Brandon Rice is like 6'2". He jumped over him and took the ball away from him in the end zone. So I just love his game. He's a sure tackler, hell of a competitor. And I think he felt some of that in the senior bowl. When people were talking and saying he just played in the MAC, he didn't play as good competition. And boy, did he go out there and strap everybody up at the senior bowl and literally is in the argument for CB1 in this draft class. Yeah, and you know, it's crazy, uh, and maybe this is why people are sleeping on him. I guess no one's sleeping on him really anymore because he is yeah. kind of projected to be one of the top two corners in the draft. But Toledo has not had a first-round pick since 1993. So wow. he would be the first – he could be the first first-round pick out of Toledo in 31 years. Uh, I had Mitchell going to the Raiders. I just think the only possible way that happens is if they cannot get the quarterback they want. Obviously, they're going to be staring yeah. at a quarterback. They probably want to take a quarterback, but you got to trade up to get the quarterback you want. You got to hope, or you, if you stay put, you have to hope that quarterback falls in your lap. If they do not get the quarterback they want, I could absolutely see them taking a corner. Uh, and so maybe he ends up in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. All right, let's go mm. to... Uh, well, you, you didn't hear my pick where I got uh, him going, please. Oh, Go, go, go. It's all good. I got him going to the Jacksonville, Jacksonville Jaguars, okay. right? They, they lost Darius Williams. Um, they released him. He went back to L.A. Now, he did sign Ronald Darby, right? But I think they could still use one more corner. I think Quinion Mitchell will fit really nicely in Ryan Nielsen's defense, the new defensive coordinator in Jacksonville. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense for him to go to Jacksonville at 17. Yeah, it really feels like Jacksonville will take a defensive player there. It seems like that's probably where their biggest holes are right now, and quarterback definitely makes sense. All right, let's look at – it feels like Quenyon Mitchell and Terry and Arnold are probably the top two corners in the draft, so let's go to Terry and Arnold, the Alabama corner. Man, Alabama, it seems like every year they have so many players taken (laughs) in the first round. It's insane. Uh, So what do you think of him, and where do you have him going? Yeah, Terry on Arnold, and it was funny, going into the season, Kool-Aid McKinstry, who I know we'll talk about later, was probably sought off as being the number one corner coming into this year. And all Terry on Arnold did was continue to put good film out, play after play. Uh, tenacity from the you know the slot position or outside, that's the thing about him, gives you that position flexibility where he can start at slot corner or he can start – on the outside as well. He's comfortable in man bumping around, but he's also comfortable in off man and has a really good feel in zone coverage. And the thing that I like about him, Brees, is he's not afraid to tackle. He'll come up and hit you. So I have him going to the Colts at 15. I had him going a little bit higher than Quinion just because of the position flexibility and the ability to play on the inside and inside, inside or outside. But you're not wrong if you go with either one of these two guys. They're both going to be studs at the next level. Yeah, it feels like the Colts are – I would be surprised if the Colts don't take a corner. That's they seem like the one team yeah. in the first round that will absolutely be taking corner, uh, and their best-case scenario would be having Mitchell and Arnold both falling down to 15, and then you just get to take the pick of what you want. Um, all right, let's – you just mentioned him, Mr. Kool-Aid, the Kool-Aid guy. Uh, it's crazy. <laughs> Alabama had two, two shut-down corners. Yeah, Man, I just that roster just was insane last season. Uh, all right, what do you think of Kool Aid? Yeah, so Kool Aid, I to me, his 22 tape was better than 23. Uh, he gives you the return man ability as well. He's a really good punt returner. Uh, he's more of a bump and run corner, right? He's comfortable in man coverage. Now, he does have high football IQ, he understands route concepts really well. The thing that gives me pause is just in that, that Texas game, A.D. Mitchell. And it wasn't just him. He, he gave Terry on Arnold issues, too, in that game as well. People were wondering about his foot speed. But he did go out there and run a 4-4-6, I believe, in the 40. So that will quell any questions. It's just like 
on tape sometimes you wonder about his foot speed, right? So I actually got him going to the Arizona Cardinals late in the first round and pairing him with Sean Murphy Bunting, who they signed in free agency. That's my spot for Kool-Aid McKinstry. Let me ask, is it, does it concern you at all? Or what goes through your head when you see a guy who has film that his tape was much better the year before than it was in his most recent season? Well, there's a, there's a lot of things to look at because, uh, you know, Caleb Williams, the same can be said about him in 22 and 23 tape. Uh, was this guy pressing? Did he succumb under the pressure, which is something that you really have to look at as well, because that's something that you have to keep your mind on. Like if it's in pressure situations, is he, is he going to falter? I just think there's a lot of attributes to look at. Also, was this guy looking at the news clippings from the year before? Because that's a real thing with young guys in regards to looking at the news clippings and, and thinking they're better than what they truly are. And then not actually focusing and honing in on the fundamentals and their, you know, of the game and their actual position. So that could be a real thing as well. So um, I, I just think there was a, a you got a couple, all that into that when it comes to Kool-Aid McKinstry, but I think he still put up pretty good tape. It just wasn't as good as 22. All right. So Deuce has Kool-Aid going to the Cardinals. I'm going to the Eagles, another bird team. I just think that Philly's probably still looking to improve their secondary. We know they have Darius Slay and James Bradbury, but two guys who are not coming off fantastic seasons. Uh, all right, let's go to Nate Wiggins, who might not make it into the first round. But you know what? We're going to project where he's going anyway, and maybe he will be a first-rounder. Yeah. What do you think, dudes? Yeah, when you look at Nate Wiggins, I think going into this process, a lot of people had him as one of the top corners. He's a burner. That's the one thing you see about him. Like, even if he's beat, he has the catch-up speed and the elite catch-up speed to catch up to his receiver, right? Not as physical as you want in the corner. He's really frail, too. I think he's only about 180, maybe even a little bit less than that. So that gives you some concerns as well, right? We remember Emmanuel Forbes last year coming out in the draft, and he kind of struggled with bigger physical receivers this year in the NFL when he went to the commander. So that's something that you worry about. But he's another guy I think needs to be in a man. He's comfortable in man coverage situations, right, where he can run with his receiver. I talked about his speed. He's never going to feel like a receiver is just going to outrun him. And he has good length as well. So I have him say that going to the Pats at the top of the second round, right? You pair him with Christian Gonzalez. Got a nice pairing at corner. Yeah, and that would be a young tandem. Maybe you have them for quite a while uh and i sent him to detroit i know we talked a lot last week about what the lines are doing at corner and obviously they made some moves made the trade for carlton davis signed amik robertson but they did lose cam sutton obviously so maybe something they look for at the bottom of the first round or maybe even the second round all right let's go to Cooper DeJean, the Iowa corner. There's been some, I guess, speculation that maybe teams will want him to move to safety. Uh, yeah. What do you think of that, dudes, and where are you sending him? I mean, he can play every position in the secondary. I, we talked about position flexibility with Terry on Arnold. Cooper DeJean can literally play the slot corner. He can play outside corner, and he can play at the safety position. And he is one of the best return men in all of college football. So when you look at his skill set, he's comfortable in man, bump and run. He's comfortable in zone coverage. I think his position flexibility helps him in, in doing his job. The team I have him going to is the Philadelphia Eagles, just because they can line them up all over the place. And one area besides corner where they struggled out last year was more specifically in the slot. And I think Cooper DeGene can help from day one. And he can also help you be the third safety if you need him to be in certain packages as well. As Again, and also be a return man when you really need him back there at punt return to go make an electrifying pay, play. So Cooper DeGene to me, to the Eagles, makes sense. You got to think about it, right? Big play stay getting up there in the age. So is James Bradbury. So Cooper DeGene comes in this year, plays a slot corner, and then transitions to outside to be your number one quarter after this year or even the following year. And, you know, with all the his return ability, it'll be interesting to see how teams factor in because maybe you can send him back there to return kickoffs because returning a kickoff is more like returning a punt now where you have you don't have Correct. guys right up on you. You know, you're, you have a, a quick break to kind of scan the field, figure out where you're going to go and, and make a big play. Uh, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see how teams factor that in and maybe factor it in a little more since you know uh, guys with returnability are going to have a little more value this year versus last year. 
Um, and I sent him to the 49ers think they could use a little bit of secondary help. And I think that he would be a good fit there. All right, let's move to our last one in the defensive back section with our corners. Ennis Rakestraw Jr. Dudes, what do you think of him? And where do you have the Missouri corner going? Breeze, hands down, my favorite player in this draft. Ooh, it's rare. Wow. It's rare that you find a corner be the tone setter on your defense. That's exactly what Ennis Rakestraw is. I mean, just turn on the Georgia tape. He took on a pulling tackle, knocked him back, and made a play on the quarterback in the backfield, right? At corner, that's what he does. When he hits you, you feel it, right? Really aggressive in man coverage, and then also the flexibility to play in the slot, which is where I think he'll start in his career with the ability to move outside. Does a really good job staying square, right? And then also being in phase, but also does a really good job of attacking the ball in the air. Now, he only had one interception in college, but had multiple PBU seasons. So that's a guy that I really like. Like I said, he's my favorite player in this draft. I think the Packers at 25 make a lot of sense. Oh, so pair him with Jair Alexander, and, you, you know, they just signed uh, and they Xavier have, McKinney. Yeah, but I think they have Stokes, too. So, like, he'll be able to start in the slot right away. That would be a good secondary in Green Bay. All right, that's it. We are done talking about the corners. Uh, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about linebackers and defensive linemen. Da, 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 da. returns April 20th to CBS. All right. It's funny here because we're going to start with linebackers and really it doesn't seem like this is a very deep draft for <laughs> at least not at the top. Correct. Um, so we might not see a linebacker get taken until the second round. Uh, but that being said, there will be linebackers drafted. So we're going to talk about them and let's start with Edrin Cooper from Texas A&M uh, dues. What do you like about him, and where do you think he'll end up? Brees, the only reason why Edron Cooper isn't going in the first round is because of position, uh, positional value, right? He's a first-round talent. And so much so that I took him as the first pick in the second round with the Panthers. All you got to do, Breach, is turn on that Alabama versus T, uh, Texas A&M film. He was clearly the best player on that field. And that's saying something when you're going to have multiple first-round picks, right? J.C. Latham, Terrion Otto, Kool-Aid McKinstry, right? All those guys are most likely going in the first. Edron, Edron Cooper was the best player on the field that day. Like, when he hits you, you go backwards. You don't go forward, right? And then his ability to blitz is underrated. His ability in zone coverage is really good. I think he ran a 4-5-1 at the combine. No linebacker diagnosis and gets downhill quicker than Edron Cooper. To me, that would be a home run pick for the Dallas Cowboys. He's not going to last to their second round pick. That's why I took him at the first pick of the second round for the Panthers because they lost Frankie Louvu this offseason. And we know Shaq Thompson is coming off an injury, but he will be there. So I think Edron, Edron Cooper to the Carolina Panthers makes a lot of sense. Do you think there's any chance he sneaks in the first round? I just no, just because of positional value. I, I don't think people in regards to the value of, you know, off ball linebackers, I don't think there's any way he's gonna go, you know, at the end of the first round. But the play on the tape is deserving of first round. All right. For this next guy, I was gonna call Will Brenton, but he's on vacation and he doesn't answer my phone calls anyway. So <laughs> it wouldn't have worked. Uh, but it is Brenton's favorite prospect in the entire draft. And I'm not sure if it's because Princeton actually thinks he's great, or if it's because Peyton Wilson went to NC State. Went to <laughs> NC State. Uh, Deuce, what do you think of Peyton Wilson, and where do you think he ends up? Or what do you think a good yeah, is? freak athlete. I think he ran a four four three at the combine, tackling machine. Would like to see him be more physical with that that big long body that I didn't see constantly on film. A lot of times running around blocks. That's why I have him slated going to the Cowboys in the second round, but also. I think there's an injury history that has some teams concerned as well. And he's an older player who's played a lot of college football already as well. But as far as a guy that can play Will Backer for you, Chase plays down from behind, also really good in zone coverage. I think Peyton Wilson is your guy. I just think he goes, you know, 
probably middle, late second round. That's why I have him slated to go to the Cowboys. All right, Peyton Wilson in Dallas, building up the linebackers, uh, pairing them with Micah Parsons. That would be a scary defense. All right, let's move to our next linebacker, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. Dudes, what do you like about the Clemson linebacker, and what do you think he ends up? Yeah, when, when you look at him, this is where me and, and Rick differ. Rick Spillman, I'm talking about. Um, he's higher on you know Jeremiah Trotter than I am. Not as high on him. I think he's a kind of a mix of an old school linebacker, more first, second down guy. Um, there's times on tape, you know, when he has to cover the back out of the backfield where he struggles real handsy, get a couple DPIs. And I didn't constantly or consistently see him be as physical as I would have liked him to be, right? So I think I marked him going to the Chargers either, I want to say maybe even the third round. I um, think it makes, makes a lot of sense for him to go to the Chargers in the third round, they lost Eric Kendricks. Uh, he could be potentially maybe um, uh, a replacement for him. And not only that, they lost uh, Murray as well in free agency. So I think there's a, a major need right there. You know, when you don't see eye to eye with Rick, did he, did he try and sell you on this? <laughs> like, come on, come on, dudes. You don't know what you're talking about. How, how does that I mean, conversation The funny come? thing is I like having debates with Rick. Um, I was big on Kobe Turner. He wasn't. We saw what happened with that. <laughs> All right. Um, but this year when we did, you know, with the first pick pod and we did edge and D-line and linebackers. We didn't argue as much this year. That was the only one where we kind of didn't see eye to eye was on, you know, uh, you know, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. That was the only time we didn't see eye to eye. I mean, Kobe Turner is a good trump card to have where, you know what, let's side with me this year because I nailed that last year. Uh, <laughs> Kobe Turner playing, looking like one of the best uh, defensive players in last year's draft class. Uh, all right, well, let's move to defensive linemen and uh, figure out where these are going to – there are there are some interesting prospects. I think you have there two are. guys that are okay. almost certainly going to go in the first round, but we could see even more. And I think the crazier thing is that we have high need. It seems like there are a lot of teams that need defensive linemen this year. Uh, so let's start with Byron Murphy out of Texas. What do you think of him, dudes? And oh. where do you think is his best fit? The best natural pass rusher in this draft, edge or D tackle. Um, plays with great leverage. Love his tape. There's times when you see on tape, Brees, where he's the zero technique. And for people that don't know what that means, he's head up on the center, right? But tech, the Texas team had Tavondre Sweat, who I know I think we're going to talk about later, who is 362. That just lets you know the mentality of, you know, what Byron Murphy brings and the leverage that he plays with the Alabama game. I remember there was a scoop block, essentially a double team with the center and guard Brees, He's so athletic and flexible that he was able to get up under both of the guys, drop a knee to the ground, split the double team and make a play on the running back in the backfield. And I talk about his natural pass rush ability. His feet never stop when he's rushing the quarterback. He can hit you with an arsenal of moves. And he's always working towards the quarterback. You never see him being stuck at the line of scrimmage. And it's rare that any teams single block him because you can't single block him. He's that explosive off the line of scrimmage. So he's my number one D tackle. I think in the mock, if I'm not mistaken, I had him going to the Rams. Wow. Surprise, right? They lose Aaron Donald and they get another a guy that can be a foundational piece on that defensive line. And you pair him with Kobe Turner. I mean, Sean McVay has to be licking his chops if Byron Murphy slips past 16 with the Seattle Seahawks and he slips past Seattle and it's there for him at 19. He's probably going to run that card in. And, and the crazy thing is the Rams haven't had a first round pick since 2016. <laughs> exactly. And then Aaron Donald retires. And now you might have the best pass or defensive lineman in the draft just kind of fall in your lap. Let me ask you this, though, because you mentioned Devondre Sweat and I'm glad you did. And we'll talk about him a little more later. But do you think there's a situation when you have two high prospects like this where one of them benefited from playing with the other one? Do you think Tavondre Sweat was a little bit better because Byron Murphy was so good? Or maybe Byron Murphy's not looked a little better because teams were so worried about Sweat? Two totally different skill sets. I just think that they fed off each other really well. I just think there's night and day. Uh, between Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat. And then also, when you look at Sweat, he's more of an old-school type player. We kind of talked about Jeremiah Trotter in that way, 
where with Sweat, you're probably only going to get first and second down. Now, he has been able to push the pocket a little bit, but he's not a pass rusher, right? And he's 360 pounds. So you also worry how many plays can he play in a row before he's gassed. Like, that's a real concern. So uh, I, I just think they had two totally different skill sets, Breeze. I don't think one benefited more from playing with the other. Yeah, and for Byron Murphy, uh, you know, you mentioned the Seahawks, that, that the Rams will have to hope he falls there. And I think the Bengals could be a possible win. That's why I said the Bengals, too. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, it feels like, obviously, they need to bring in a replacement for DJ Reader, which they haven't really done yet. Just someone strong on the defensive line. I, I do think the Bengals probably are eyeing offensive linemen but again, it's one of those situations where you have your top four tackles off the board or something. There's no reason to reach for the fifth best guy when you have possibly the best defensive lineman fall in your lap. All right, let's go to the guy who was kind of 1B on the defensive line board, and that is Johnny Newton out of Illinois. Dudes, what do you think of him, and what do you think he ends up? And you stated it perfect, Brees, 1B, because that's how I look at it, right? Like, I went back and forth. I was having this discussion with our, our Ryan Wilson the other day. And, you know, I, I broke down Byron Murphy, you know, earlier in the process. Uh, looked at him a little bit later. But I just really rewatched Johnny Newton's tape again. I'm like, dang, am I sure Byron Murphy's number one? But I am sure. I think the difference is when you're talking about the leverage that Byron Murphy can play with, against the run, I think it supersedes what Johnny Newton can do. Sometimes you'll see Johnny Newton get engulfed by offensive linemen, but nobody rushes with a better rush plan from the defensive tackle position than Johnny Newton. We kind of talked about lie to lot to in that manner earlier in the show in regards to always having a plan, right? Johnny Newton, the same thing. He never just rushes and runs down the middle of somebody, Brees. He always has a plan, does a really good job with swipes, clubs, to win against uh, quarterbacks. And you also see him win with power as well. So um, I say to him going, another surprise, going to the Miami Dolphins, they lost Christian Wilkins, right? Why not replace Christian Wilkins with a guy, to me, who's actually a better rusher than Christian Wilkins, but you can use in a multitude of ways as, as well. And he's not going to be a liability against the run. He does a really good job of knocking guys back as a penetrating three technique. Yeah, I think both the Rams or Dolphins would be happy to get Murphy or Newton uh, if either guy ends up falling down there. All right, let's go to Braden Fisk. It really kind of mm. blows my mind that we could have, you know, we just talked about Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy, both on that Texas defensive line. And now we're, we're talking about Braden Fisk and Jared Verse. Uh, Jared Verse obviously going to be taken higher in the draft, but what do you think of Braden Fisk? You think he could be a first rounder? Where do you have him ending up? What's your take on him? Yeah, I think he's, his, his sweet spot is early second round, right? Uh, this is a high-motor guy. The motor never stops. One of the best pass rushing defensive tackles in this draft as well. And people question his arm length going into it. But the thing is, his mindset is, I know I have to be quicker off the snap than the offensive line because if I get into him before he gets into me, I can win the rep. And that's how, when you look at it on film, that's what it looks like. When you look at the Florida game, when you look at the Louisville game, where he takes over. I mean, his get off is crazy. And I was talking to Ryan Wilson about him going into the senior bowl week because, you know, a lot of people probably had him as a, you know, fourth round pick, maybe chance late third. And I told Ryan, I said, that's my D tackle three. I said, you need to pay attention Ooh. to this dude. And sure enough, after the senior bowl, I had already seen it on tape, but after the senior bowl, there was no more questions. He was D tackle three after that. And then, to double down on that breach, he went and literally destroyed the combine, right? So now you're talking about could he go in the top 10 of the second round, which I have him going to the Houston Texans. They lost Nico Collins. Supposedly they were in the running for Eric Armstead, didn't get him. Why not replace him with a guy like Braden Fist, who fits exactly, exactly what my guy D'Amico Ryans wants to do with the Houston Texans in that defensive line. They want to come at you at waves. They got to Neil Hunter. They did lose Jonathan Gennard, but they signed to Neil Hunter. Imagine adding Braden Fist to Neil Hunter and having Will Anderson on that defensive line. And they got to Nico Autry as well. Woo! That's a front four from hell. And I feel like Nico Autry is one of those underrated signings. The most kind of underrated player for the last decade in the NFL. Insane. I've been saying it. <laughs> and D'Amico Ryans knows how to build a defense. I mean, obviously, he's been a very good – he was a good defense coordinator with the 49ers, and he's just – you you get a little worried when they get hired as head coach. Maybe they're in over their head, especially their first year, and, uh, you know, you got to delegate and figure out what you're doing. He didn't need that. He didn't need that warm-up period, 
And man, their defense is loaded. All right, let's move on to Michael Hall Jr. Ah, right, dudes. Where do you think he ends up? And what do you think of him? Yeah, so we talked about Kobe Turner earlier, right? Kind of undersized D tackle, pass rush ability. Michael Hall fits in that same manner. And uh, that, that was the argument with Rick last year. Like, he didn't realize the way the league is changing. There's a place for designated pass rushers in the interior defensive line. Also, we've also seen an influx, Brees, of defensive tackles getting played, paid like their counterparts on the edge. When you talk about guys like Quentin Williams getting paid, Ed Oliver getting paid, right? The 2D tackles with the Washington Commanders, Chris Jones. Like, if you can affect the quarterback, there's a role for you on the team. I think Michael Hall to the Cincinnati Bengals, we could have projected Byron Murphy potentially going there, but why not send Michael Hall, one of the best first-step get-offs in this draft, three technique that can penetrate, pair him with a guy like B.J. Hill and Sheldon Rankins, who you just signed on a one-year deal, I think it makes a lot of sense to send him to Cincinnati. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as the as the official Bengals homer on this podcast, I'd be thrilled if Michael Hall Jr. landed in their lap at 49th overall. Uh, and that could happen if they end up taking the offensive lineman at 18th overall. Uh, but they do have a lot of options. And again, they do need to fill that hole kind of that was left by DJ Reader. All right, our last defensive lineman. We mentioned him a little bit earlier, Tavondre Sweat. Who knows what's going to happen with him now because he got in trouble dealing with some yeah. legal issues. Just, man, all you gotta do is stay out of trouble the month of April uh, or your draft stock is going to tank. It, it looked like maybe he was second rounder probably before last week. I mean, I would say I had him in the third. I don't know. If third? Okay. Second, but do you yeah. think this drops his draft stock and what do you have him going now? Well, yeah, I think it will drop his draft stock because supposedly just talking to a few people, that was the question mark about him. Some of his, partying ways and i hate putting rumors out there but usually it's not a really good look when you get pulled over and get a dwi two weeks before the draft because you're technically still in the process breeze right teams could still potentially work you out in private workouts and for you to get a dui this close to the draft when you know this is going to be probably one of the most important moments in your life i think teams are going to look at that i think it may drop him to the fourth round so i mocked him to the fourth round to the seattle seahawks they did repay and sign Leonard Williams to an extension. They have Draymond Jones as a guy that can play inside and outside. I think they could use a run stuff and guy. They've always had a guy like Red Bryan or Al Woods. I think Dre, I mean, so Rajay Sweat could be that guy for them. They had Puna Ford for a lot of years as well. I think it makes a lot of sense to, to have a guy, even, even though now Mac McDonald's going over there, let's not forget he had a guy that was similar to him and Michael Pierce at the Baltimore Ravens. So Tavondre Sweat to the Seattle Seahawks is where I marked him in the fourth round. Yeah, McDonald loves those types of guys. And, you know, I'm just going to mention the Bengals again. If they don't end up one with the <laughs> – if they don't get the defensive lineman in the first round, they don't get him in the second round, and Tavondre Sweat falls to the fourth round, uh, they pick at 115, and I would be thrilled if they got him there. All right, we are going to cover the safeties now. And, look, this is not a very deep safety draft. Uh, and again, you know, we talked about the linebackers and, and maybe teams aren't valuing them as high as they should. But I think the other problem with the safeties, besides that it feels like safeties are just not valued as much as they used to be, is that you have so many guys out there that you can sign a free agency. So, I mean, Justin Simmons is still out there. Yeah. Paul Adams is still out there. Uh, so what is your take on the safeties? I guess we'll start with Tyler Newbin from Minnesota. Yeah, Tyler Newbin is a French guy that could potentially go late first, but I think just because of positional value, he'll go in the second. I think a team that makes a lot of sense to me, and he's probably the best ball hawk in safety. He just has an act for fought, you know, to find the ball. And Reese, one thing you'll find out about the safety group, there's a lot of guys that can play in the box, a couple guys that can play half field safety, but there's only a few that can play both. And Tyler Newbin is one of those guys that could be in the end of box safety or he could be a half field safety as well. So when I look at him, to me, the commanders make a lot of sense. Now, I know they, they, they did sign Jeremy Chen, who I think Dan Quinn will use kind of like as a, a weapon X, just like he's probably going to use Frankie Louvu as a, a weapon X. And we know he likes to have smaller linebackers. So could Chen even potentially move to the linebacking position? You lost Cam Curl in free agency. I think Tyler Newbin makes a lot of sense for the commanders uh, in the second round, early in the second round. I believe they have two second round picks. The commanders, Tyler Newbin. What about 
Javon Bullard from UGA. Yeah, when you look at Javon Bullard, I talked about guys that could play, you know, middle field or, you know, in the box safety. And I think he's more of an in the box safety. But the thing is, his mentality will make up for the lack of athletic ability when I talk about his overall speed and reasons why he could potentially play half field safety for you as well, or maybe even slot corner. He's a guy that can play in the box, can play over the tight ends. He understands route concepts. He understands how offenses are trying to attack him. And it's that mentality that he has helps him in regards to catching up with the lack of foot speed that he has. I think pairing him with a guy like Jesse Bates with the Falcons makes too much sense. A guy that went to Georgia, so, you know, not too far down the road as well. Uh, he, he could be the in-the-box guy for the Atlanta Falcons while Jesse Bates roams the middle of the field and does what he does as one of the best ball-hawking safeties. I think Javon Bullard makes a lot of sense to the Atlanta Falcons in the second second round. Now, there aren't a ton of highly rated safeties, really first-round safeties out there. It'll be surprising if we see any. What teams do you think will look to target safeties? Obviously, you mentioned the Commanders. The Falcons, I think we could probably yeah. throw the Bills in there. They lost a couple safeties. Uh, anybody else you think we should look for that, that that could go safety hunting in the second or third I think round? Tennessee Titans could potentially look for a safety position. I think in the third round, the Jets, it's an underrated need for them. And to me, Bruce, it's not even underrated because when you look at their roster currently constructed, right, they lost – Whitehead, he went back to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Ashton Davis, who was their third safety, is still a free agent right now. If you look at the roster right now, they only have Chuck Clark, who's coming off a major knee injury, and Tony Adams. So a guy that I really like, and I have mocked to them, Cole Bishop, uh, in the third round from Utah, makes a lot of sense. Love the way that he plays, plays with a lot of effort. He's a guy that's more of an in-the-box safety guy, but has the athletic ability that if you need him to play half-field safety, he can, right? Does a really good job in zone coverage, especially in the flat and down the seam. And the thing that I love about him, he's a sure tackler, Brees. Like, he's – you rarely see him miss any tackles. And an uh, underrated part of his game is blitzing. He can get to the quarterback, and Jeff Albrick is known to either send a slot corner or a safety from time to time to get after the quarterback when he decides to blitz. Doesn't have to do it a lot because they have a really good defensive line, but when he wants to switch it up, I think Cole Bishop with that skill set is an underrated guy that I think could go in the third round to the Jets. And Dues is saying that live from the Jets facility. Do not forget that. <laughs> uh, maybe a little inside information. Now, guess what, dudes? We're going to your favorite position. Harry. Your decided favorite to... position. What no? <laughs> Harry decided to throw me a bone. We went through. Uh, dudes knows more about defense uh, than uh, 20 times more about defense than I do and is quite the expert. Now we're going to move to kickers, though. And you know what? I, I know you were saying, look, it's kickers breach. You just do it. But I'm going to give you the first one because okay. you already have a team ready. And I do. everybody's seen him kick because he's been on the national stage for so long. And that is Will Reichardt. Uh, where would you like to see him end up, dudes? Yeah, I saw him at the Senior Bowl. Really efficient kicker. Uh, to me, even though the Pats took a kicker last year, Chad Ryland, who only you know converted 64% of his field goals, I think you bring in some competition. And I'm not sure if Reichardt would actually get drafted, but as a free agent, if I'm him, I'm eyeing that spot just because the kicker isn't kicking with a lot of confidence right now. And People always say this, right? You don't know how important a kicker is until you need him. To me, the kicker position is the, probably the second highest pressure position on the field, right? Because, again, you don't know how badly you need a kicker until the game is on the line and you need him to go out there and make that field go to win. So I think, you know, Reichardt to the Pats via, you know, undrafted free agent or maybe even the seventh round makes a lot of sense. Let me ask you this. What did you – like, what was your – mental feeling toward kickers when you played were you did you ever even talk to your kicker did you even know who your kicker oh, was Nick Folk was Nick Folk was my guy when I was here with the Jets like that was my guy I talked to him all the time um everywhere else I've been you know as far as the kicker love and respect for him teammate hey just do your job when we need you bro because a lot of times when we over there running through practice y'all over there on the opposite field just chilling or, you know, you're playing ping pong. So as long as you do your job, I'm not tripping. But, yeah, when I was here, Nick Folk was my guy. Uh, and he's still he's still thriving. He's that still guy, kicking he's, it away. He's just sticking around. Um, I don't think we'll see more than three kickers taken. We saw three last year. That's kind of been the sweet spot. There's never been more than three over the past 10 years. 
Uh, so I'll just go real quickly over probably the three best kickers in the draft. We just mentioned Will Reichard, and I think the Patriots would make a lot of sense. I have them going to the Rams only because I think the Rams are the most kicker needy team right now. And I think That's they true. would be the most likely to spend a high draft pick, maybe fourth round. Uh, on a kicker because that's what you do when you are desperate cam little from arkansas uh i'm sure everybody's reading the headlines from the ufl about jake bates the guy who can kick 60 yard field goals like they're nothing made a 64 yarder in week one made a 62 yarder in week two well he went to arkansas and the reason he didn't win the kicking job is because he was playing behind cam little uh which Mm -hmm. tells you about how good cam little is i have him going to the patriots um but i do think if reichard fell to the sixth or seventh round that he could end up in New England. But as you said, dudes, they drafted a, the, a kicker last year, and they may feel burnt by that and saying, hey, you know what, we'll just wait till, uh sign a guy as in the drafted free agent. And then finally, Joshua Cardi out of Stanford. I'm sending him Ooh. to Detroit. The Lions okay. have Michael Badgley. I don't think they're thrilled with their kicking situation, though, so I do think they will have some competition uh, when we get to training camp. Dudes, did you want to toss in anything else about kickers? Nah, I think you handled it beautifully, Brees. Down to the, the the pick and even potentially, you know, the Pats because they took somebody in the draft, not wanting to get burned again and taking somebody as an undrafted free agent. All right. Well, then that is it. We're ending on a high note or a low note, depending on how you feel about kickers. That's the <laughs> nah. end of the show. We will be back on Thursday. We're going to do this. Uh, we're going to talk about the best pick of all time in each of the 32 draft slots. And it's a mailbag, which are Ooh. always exciting. For dues, I am John Breach. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, uh, leave nice notes to us on Twitter. You can write us in the mail if you get our address. I don't know where it is. Do something. We'll see you guys soon. Have a good one.